Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are talking about Sandy Monroe's initial teardown of the Model Y. I think he's, I don't know, maybe about halfway through or so now, so I wanted to go through some of his takeaways so far. And then as we close the week here, we'll also talk a little bit about the stock performance today. Starting out with the Model Y though, this teardown from Sandy Monroe of Monroe & Associates is something we've been looking forward to for a long time for the Model Y. You may remember Monroe was pretty critical and complimentary of Tesla's Model 3, and we know some of the feedback that Monroe has given to Tesla and to Elon Musk has been adopted by Tesla, so we've all been anxiously awaiting his reactions to the Model Y. Monroe has been posting the teardown as he goes, so starting off with fit and finish on the exterior, and then breaking it down all the way down to the wheels now, so I guess probably not quite halfway. So we'll go through the main takeaways for each of those categories that he has discussed so far, and just his overall impressions from all of those videos, as well as a couple interviews he did with Bloomberg and with AutoLine. So starting off with fit and finish, I think the best way that this was encapsulated by Monroe was a statement that he made to AutoLine saying, quote, the fit and finish is much, much better than it was before, but there are still some flaws, end quote. What he's referring to here with fit and finish is essentially the size of the gaps and the consistency in the size of the gaps throughout the vehicle. The first part of that is that if you have inconsistent gaps, things can be misaligned and then you can see that visually and it looks like it's poor quality. But the second part of that, which is probably a little bit more important, is that those gaps being inconsistent can mean misalignment that may potentially lead to service issues down the road. Could also lead to louder wind noise and squeaks and rattles, things like that. So visually, Monroe thought this looked pretty good. He said, quote, I can tell you right from here, I don't even need my gap gauge. This looks in pretty good shape, end quote. Adding that, quote, my first impression was that the car looked good, end quote. So no major visual issues, but upon measuring, he did find some couple millimeter gaps and for this particular vehicle, those were generally occurring with the lift back. Even with that though, still much better than the Model 3 initial quality and Tesla will continue to refine and tweak these things to improve that consistency as they get production more up to speed, which Monroe recognizes saying, quote, all in all, not bad, still not as good as what I'd like to see, end quote, adding, quote, for an early stage product, this is pretty good, end quote. Next up was a little bit of a mishap with some of the components of the frunk, so the front trunk, the plastic covering behind the frunk, so the part closer to the cabin, was actually not snapped into place. So one of the clips that would keep that snapped into place was broken, and one of the other plastic fasteners was completely missing, so not great there. But that did actually give Monroe an opportunity for a suggestion. So in the video immediately following the frunk mishap, Monroe did some analysis on the particular clip that had broken, highlighting the fragility of that particular clip and giving a redesign recommendation for a different style saying that's really the goal of these teardowns to help Tesla iterate and improve, noting that they actually gave Tesla a list of about 250 ideas for improvement on the Model 3, and as we said, some of those have been implemented. Next up was the suspension. Not a ton on this, basically saying that the Model Y suspension was similar to the Model 3, but not exactly the same. Although I do wonder if they're comparing to the most recent Model 3 or just comparing to their previous teardown, because we know Tesla iterates on those things quickly. Not that they're ever going to be identical, but they may be more similar than a comparison with an older Model 3, but regardless, still a lot of commonality. And Monroe actually highlighted a part of the rear suspension that actually had a Model 3 label on it. The next thing was taking a look at some of the other components under the vehicle, so wiring, brakes, things like this. And one of the things that Monroe highlighted as being particularly impressive to him was the corrugated wrapping that Tesla is using over the 12 volt wiring, saying that's a really uncommon form of wrapping for an automaker to use, but should be extremely durable and saying that it would never see a short because of that. And then he was also very impressed with the connector types that Tesla used for their valving under the vehicle. They used quick connectors, which as the name implies, is a way to quickly connect tubing, essentially by snapping the connection together, rather than the alternative method, which would be using a threaded connector and a wrench. So from a cost benefit perspective, it seems like those are a little bit more expensive, however, would be more durable, more secure in terms of keeping things airtight and liquid tight, and of course, being quick connectors should also help with production speed as well. The thing that came to mind for me when Monroe was talking about this was Tesla's goal to make their vehicle last for a million miles. Both the quick connectors and then in particularly the corrugated wrapping seem to be focused around longevity, so well in alignment with that goal. At this point, Monroe finally gets to what makes him quote unquote happiest, and that was the much anticipated rear casting that we've talked about before. Sandy Monroe describing this piece of huge casting versus what on the Model 3 would have been a lot of different stamped pieces by saying, quote, this gigantic aluminum casting that takes up probably a third of the back end of the car, I'm really thrilled with, end quote. Speaking to the efficiencies of that decision, Monroe said, quote, it'll be self-locating, 
it's going to be wonderfully easy to put that whole section in, end quote, adding, quote, it's a really good idea, end quote, and you could really hear the excitement in his voice talking about this piece. Next up, and the last part for now until the teardown continues, was the wheels and the wheel wells. The biggest takeaway here was that Tesla is using an external hex screw with the wheels rather than an internal hex screw, which I guess is more frequently used, and the wheels have to be designed around that external hex screw, otherwise they won't fit, so that would limit the aftermarket wheel options, so just kind of a heads up on that. Overall, Monroe seemed really happy with it. I think looking at my notes here, the only thing that I forgot to mention was he had a little bit of criticism on the paint, saying that he could feel some dust or dirt when running his hand over it, but it didn't seem to come through visually, so probably not something that many customers would notice, and unlike fit, which could potentially lead to some of those service issues that we talked about, paint is more cosmetic, obviously, so from a business standpoint there, nothing to be concerned about, but hopefully Tesla will improve that over time, or maybe just a one-off with this car. So we'll keep an eye on this teardown as it progresses. Obviously, if you want to watch these full videos, you can just search on YouTube for Monroe Model Y. All right, so moving on in the stock, just a couple of quick comments I wanted to make here as we close out the week. So Tesla on the day today did finish up 5.6% to $480 per share. That compared to the NASDAQ down 1.5%, but obviously that $480 finish is a far cry from the $545 I think we peaked at during after hours yesterday after the delivery announcement. So I did just want to at least briefly touch on this and just kind of reiterate what I said in the latter half of yesterday's episode. The Q1 delivery numbers and production numbers are behind us now. That was a show of strength for Tesla, but unfortunately, in the situation we're in right now, uncertainty reigns. Tesla had a chance yesterday to try to give investors more certainty, and they did not take it. And I think that is what is going to be concerning until we get to the earnings report. I'm not saying that's any fault of Tesla's right now. Obviously, there's uncertainty not just for investors, but for Tesla as a business. And while the Q1 numbers were nice, it doesn't matter if, for example, let's just say in a very negative scenario here, not numbers that I believe, but just hypothetical because these all are technically possible. What if Fremont is shut down for the entirety of Q2? And what if Gigafactory Shanghai is only producing, you know, a thousand or two thousand cars a week? Or what if some of that production relies on Gigafactory Nevada, which is currently 25% staffed by Tesla and 0% staffed by Panasonic, at least as far as we know. And if all of that stuff kind of happened, you could see worst case scenario production numbers being like 20,000 units or something like that. Tesla's got about 30,000 units in inventory. They could maybe run that down to 10,000 or 15,000. But even in that case, with that type of a production number, you're looking at potentially something as low as 35,000 deliveries. And unfortunately for Q2, the benchmark kind of flips. In Q1, we had a low benchmark because a lot of inventory couldn't be delivered in Q1. That then got pushed into Q2, which is raising the benchmark for Q2. So last year in Q2, Tesla delivered 95,000 vehicles. That would mean a number like 35,000 would be down 63% year over year. Now, before you hit the dislike button on this or stop listening or whatever, I don't think any of that stuff is going to happen, and I don't think Tesla thinks any of that stuff is going to happen either, because if they did, they probably actually would have lowered guidance. But put whatever numbers you want in there, whatever length of time shutdown you want, whatever production rate, whatever year-over-year -year comparison, those are the sort of uncertainties that are going to weigh the stock down and make the Q1 numbers not really all that important right now. It's the same stuff that we talked about with the macro environment. Right now, there are questions, and the questions are outweighing the answers. Kind of a downer note to end the week on that, so I guess I want to reiterate my congratulations to Tesla for a really strong Q1, but that will do it for this week. As always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications, and make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. I'll see you next time for the Monday, April 6th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.